Welcome to Behind the Screen. I'm Carolyn Giardina, and in this special episode, you'll hear The Hollywood Reporter's full animation roundtable, which was recorded remotely on November 5th with filmmakers from Encanto, Flea, Luca, The Mitchells vs. The Machines, Raya and the Last Dragon, Spirit Untamed, and Vivo. Let's meet our guests. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Carolyn. Hey, how are you? Glad to be here. Hello. I'm going to let each of you introduce yourselves. Phil, would you like to start? Yeah, my name is Phil Lord, and I'm uh, one of the producers of The Mitchells versus The Machines. I'm Clark Spencer, and I'm one of the producers of Encanto. Hi, I'm Elaine Bogan, director of Spirit Untamed with DreamWorks. Hey, hey, I'm Kiara. Um, along with Kirk D'Amico, I co wrote the screenplay for Vivo. My name is Carlos Lopez Estrada. I, along with Don Hall, directed Raya and the Last Dragon. Hey, my name is Jonas Poirasmus, and I directed the animated documentary Fleet. I'm Enrico Casarosa. Hello, and I directed Luca at Pixar. So in October, some of you had movies at the Animation is Film Festival in Hollywood. Animation is Film, what does that idea mean to you? Um, well, I, 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 I think I'm kind of the rookie in the crowd here. Like, like Flea is my first animation project. So this has really been a discovery for me. Uh, and, and to me, um, what was amazing about doing Flea as animation was that, you know, uh, possibilities are endless. Like, like everything can be done. And I'm used to, you know, working in documentary where you really kind of tie it down to what you record, what you catch when you're out there in the field. But here it was really liberating to, to feel how you could uh, be so precise when you start something with animation. Well, um, Jonas, let's elaborate on that a little bit. So your um, animated documentary, Flea, is about your friend who reveals that he made a harrowing journey as a child refugee from Afghanistan. Now, animation, among things, allowed him to maintain his privacy. But why, would you elaborate on why you picked animation for this story? Well, first of all, it was really what, what, what liberated, liberated him to tell his story because he wanted to be anonymous. But also because, you know, it's a story that takes place in the past. Uh, so really to make his childhood home, come back alive, Afghanistan in the 80s, Moscow in the 90s, and kind of place him in the situation. Um, but also because Flea is really a story about memory and trauma. And with the animation, it enables us to be more expressive um, when there are things that is hard for him to talk about or he has a hard time remembering. We could go more into his emotion and be more, more honest to what he felt than trying to be, you know, super realistic on to what things looked like or what actually happened. What about the rest of you? What is animation is film? What does that mean to you? We often talk um, in our world about the idea that animation is a medium, not a genre. And the medium is film and cinema. And it really goes to the very beginning of our um, uh, art form. And it, it really, to me, it's, it's no different. It's sort of synonymous. I think for me, I before I even discovered film, um, animation was, is so ingrained in my life since before I could probably even speak. So I think I, it, it's it's responsible for the way that my brain molded and my my imagination and my creativity. Uh, and I, I feel like it's it's just so like. The, the fabric of who I am today as, as a person, as an artist is definitely, I think I, I, I blame the animated movies that I, I watched obsessively growing up. So to me, it just, it became sort of like my, my window into the creative and the artistic worlds and, and now revisiting it as an adult, it, it really just felt like connecting with uh, such, such an essential part of, who I am as a person. Um, I didn't realize how important it was to me until I, I revisited it recently. Just jumping in on that for, I, I'm also a rookie here. I come from the world of playwriting and Vivo is my first animated film. And I, I think for me, I approach it as these these archetypes that get created from these movies and these films that we watch that make us who we are. They become larger than life. They become archetypal and 
we inherit them and, you know, then we progress those archetypes or rebel against them or expand upon them. And I, you know, th that's what I was really thinking of as I was creating these characters is what am I going to do with these animated archetypes and how am I going to, um, you know, honor that or fight back or, you know, sometimes both of both of those things together. And I think one of my favorite things about thinking about animation as, as film and filmmaking is the storytelling part. It's not for animation. We, we really severely have to premeditate every single aspect of that filmmaking. So an animated film by the end of it, it's not just a bunch of characters running around on screen saying stuff to tell a story. You have to really premeditate your, your cameras, your color to tell a story, your music tells a story, your, your the evolution of design throughout a film tells a story. And it's all like all of those aspects coming together at the end. For, for me, that's filmmaking. It's very fun. Well, let's talk about the rest of your movies. Which character in your movie did you most relate to and why? And Enrico Luco is set on the Italian Riviera, which is where you grew up. Would you like to start? Yeah, it, it, it's a wonderful question. Yeah, yeah, I'm certainly very, very close to Luca. My my best friend, uh, when I was uh, a shy 11 year old, I, I met my best friend and he was, we left his name the same, Alberto, but I felt like, hey, I can't leave my name in it, it would be too, <laughs> too much. <laughs> so yeah, I certainly was very uh, sheltered and, and shy. So it, it becomes this wonderful question about how to make sure that you're telling a very personal story. Uh, but also how do you let collaboration around you and animation not, I can't think of a more collaborative medium uh, with your writers, with your story team and, and how to make the, the very personal universal. So the, um, but, but I think what happens very early in the process of making, telling a story is that people like to tell you the like, Oh, I had, a, I had a friend like that. Oh, I, I was, or I was a troublemaker and I dragged uh, my friend in it. So, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of me and Luca I was definitely a, you know, a, a kid who struggled a little bit to get out there and chase what he wanted. And, um, I, I loved how that kind of opened up these discussions with all our collaborators to, um, about these friendships that we have when they're with someone very different from us. You know, for me, I think it's Mirabelle. She's the main character and she's a character surrounded by a family where everyone has an extraordinary gift and she, for some reason, doesn't. And she, on the exterior, tries to always have this sense of confidence and say that it's okay, but on the interior is very insecure and wonders why. And my career started on Wall Street in finance, right? I'm a finance person at my heart and somehow ended up at Disney Animation by accident, honestly, grew a career and now am a producer doing something I love. I mean, the ironic thing is my grandparents owned a movie theater when I was a kid, so it should have all been sort of what I was planning to do, but it never was. It's coincidence that I'm in this job and every day surrounded by the most talented people in the world who are the best at what they do and wonder how the hell did I get into this position? Am I really good enough to be doing it? So I think in so many ways, I relate to her because I'm always pinching myself saying, you know, how am I this ordinary person who knows finance in a creative position and, and get to be responsible for bringing these stories, as people were saying, these stories to life that impact people, right? Go around the world and impact people. And that's, it's pretty amazing. So I'd say Mirabelle is the character I relate to. As I think as soon as I became involved with the, the Spirit movie, I had no choice but to relate myself to the main character, Lucky. Um, I've been a horse rider and equestrian since I was eight or nine years old. And, uh, I, a lot of our story is about the, a human trying to form some sort of communication with a 1200 pound animal and form a partnership with it in order to get where they need to go. And, uh, I've experienced a lot of that in my, in my childhood. So a lot of that story was very much from, from life experience. Phil. Well, um, our uh, protagonist is Katie Mitchell, a 17-year-old young film student. Um, and I think one of the th things we had to do as a crew is remember what it felt like to do it all for the first time and to not experience um, a whole lot of shame. <laughs> and, and what I love about Katie is she's just um, letting her... Uh, she's trying all the film techniques for the first time. She's using cardboard boxes and duct tape 
and drawing on top of the screen and just relishing in what it feels like to express yourself and show people who you are for the first time. And uh, one of the tricks, because we had to innovate a lot in order to express that visually, was to get a 500-person crew to behave like a 17-year-old film student (laughs) and and uh and it was really liberating watching everybody take that on and bring a lot of freedom and innovation to the screen i love hearing where who everyone's identifying with i mean this is this is just such a like writing water cooler that's wonderful um for me there's you know there's a little bit of my heart in in every character or maybe a lot of a lot of myself in every character but i do think of gabby who is um befriends our lead character vivo um much to his chagrin he does not really want to be friends with this chaotic wild child of a tween but uh the thing i really love about gabby is she has something that no none of the more sophisticated and adult characters in the movie have which is she is more in tune and in touch with her inner voice. Um, I, I think she has had has been forced to do that because she is an outsider. She doesn't really fit in with her Girl Scout like troop, which is the Sand Dollars. Um, and so, you know, she's had to think about, well, who am I and what's my place in the world more than some of the other characters have been forced to. Uh, but I love that about her, and so she really lets loose. She doesn't carry a lot of shame around who she is. Uh, but my favorite part of her, and, and I relate to that as a writer, you know, you have to go through these journeys of who am I? What matters to me? Um, how am I looking at the world? Um, she has in her song, which is very wild and loud, like she is, she ha- the, the bridge of it is really interior and internal. And my son calls that the, uh, the inside part, you know, where she just goes straight to the source and talks about, am I lonely? Am I alone? What are the relationships of those things, even in this kind of wild child energy? So I I love that it's all there for her, the the volume 11 and the volume one and and the search for the self inside of that. I'm in my own film. So, so it's, (laughs) that's cheating. (laughs) Even though I'm blonde in the film, it's, it's no, but uh, I, 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 of course, relate mostly to Amin in my story as well, because it's really his, his journey we're on. Um, and I think um, his journey is going from Afghanistan to Denmark, but it's really about, you know, finding a place in the world where he can be with everything that entails. So it's both his past, his sexuality and everything. And I think in every person's life, there's, there's a point where you're kind of looking for that place where you feel like you can be who you are. Um, so that's, even though I'm in the film, <laughs> I, I relate to Amin's journey, definitely. I'm going to say R- Raya, who is our lead character, and, and why I relate so much to her is because she she's essentially a character who's lost all trust in humans. And not to say that that is the part that I relate with, but the time where we were telling this story and where we are at in this country and beyond uh, it has been really challenging. I think last year was very, very difficult. Um, and to see a character who who really sees how broken people are, who is just really jaded by our ways, uh, and who has to learn to trust again, who has to who has to figure out how to see eye to eye with people with completely different ideologies, and eventually is able to to coexist with all these people who are just seemingly impossibly different from her. Um, I, I just, for me, from, from the very beginning and when we started working on this movie, um, I related so much to that. I related to the struggles that she goes through and, and her journey back to trust uh, is one that I just felt was so necessary, not just for me, but for all the people around me. So I, I think for all of those reasons, um, I consider Raya's journey just so vital to my own personal one. I also wanted to talk about voice casting during the conversation. So Carlos, why did you cast Kelly Marie Tran as Raya? I mean, the character of Raya, I think was so specifically written. We and Adele gave her such a, uh, a wholly original voice and she 
as I mentioned, her, her sort of like foundation as a character is like really complicated, but also she's quippy and she has a sense of humor that is sharp and she needs to keep up with Aquafina. Uh, and, and this was just a, a, an actor that needed to play so many different shades and needed to have, um, like, essentially, we, we thought of it as crafting uh, a superhero. And and uh, and Kelly just em- really embraced all of the layers of the character. Uh, Kelly brought a heart to it and I think related to Raya on such a deep level. Uh, and she really set the tone for the entire film. I think that we saw how much it meant to Kelly to play this role for different reasons. I think personally, also just representing uh, her culture in Southeast Asians who are really don't really get a, a, a chance to be on screen um, as, as much as 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 the other peoples that we've seen in animated movies. And I think just Kelly connected to the character and to the movie on such a, a beautiful level that we really she set the bar for for voice cast and every single person who came on after I think saw uh, the the sort of like the this deep personal connection that we have established with with Raya and it really just built on every single person who came on saw the emotional potential in this movie saw how timely it was and 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 it just really became this love fest where where uh we were all we all felt like we were telling a story that needed to be told when we were telling it how we were telling it so i i think just kelly really started to shape the movie in a way that was really, really meaningful. Phil, I've been wanting to ask you, what gave you the idea to cast Olivia Coleman as your oh. maniacal virtual assistant? Uh, well, she's an international treasure. I've admired her since Peep Show and since she showed up in Hot Fuzz. <laughs> so it was like amazing that, uh, good for us, uh, that she... Won, won, uh, won some awards in the meantime. Um, you know, you just want someone who's going to hold your attention when they're just like a little square on the screen. <laughs> and she just has so many moves. You know, she's like, she gets it. She's super game. I couldn't show her my face while we were recording her. I just was like too ashamed as a human being to be around greatness like that. It's not different from how I feel around when, when I've met um, Kelly Tran, by the way, she's like so magnetic and you want to put your life in her hands. And it's just not a surprise that she's, she shines in your movie. Um, it is, it's amazing. Like that one of the things in animation is like you get, um, people are so willing to be part of it. You know, if you get to work with such um, incredible creative people. I can talk a bit about working with kids and how amazing it is, how difficult it can be, <laughs> but how joyful uh, a process we have. Jacob Tremblay, Jack Dylan Grazier, and a newcomer that we found here in San Francisco, Emma Berman as Julia. And um, for us, the story was like finding professional, because both Jacob and Jack Dylan probably are some of the most professional kids out there. But they were very playful. They wanted to play. We were after a certain naturalism. Anything that felt too polished, we we never f- feels right to me. I wanted mistakes. I wanted a little repetition. And um, both Jacob and Jack were so game to take the page away. Let's not even look at it. And how would you say a uh, riffing? And um, and it's interesting. Then a newcomer like Emma Berman with Julia brought it. Even she she brought herself the first time I met her. She was just chuckling as she was shaking my hand and I kind of knew she was Julia. Uh, Something special about how kids really bring something about themselves. So for me, it's like get kids that are really willfully, willful to to play and and not be embarrassed or have any self-consciousness. And then uh, get kids that really bring something that it's innate in them. That was kind of the our, our learning curve on it. Um, and it's funny because everybody says like you know how hard it is, but I would I would do it again in a, 
absolutely because it's just there's something kind of magical about it when you get to and you get to laugh and and be a goofball and be a five-year-old as you record them too which makes your day pretty pretty awesome i i once had to um take gaff tape and put an x on the ground where a young actor was only allowed to stand because <laughs> <laughs> he was running around too much <laughs> that was like there's a microphone here you could do any you can move however you want as long as you stand on this x yeah. It's often Chris and I will um, will audition a bunch of professional actors. And Jacob is great, uh, and and just we'd rather put you know uh, somebody who's not professional on the microphone. Um, I don't know if I'd be willing to do it for a whole movie, but a lot of times it winds up being somebody's nephew with like an interesting voice, and thus you need the gaff tape and the X. <laughs> Well, and I think we're enough of what you just said, Phil, but we're, in animation, we're looking for the voice, right? We're really looking and listening to that voice. And the interesting thing in Encanto in is when Stephanie Beatrice, who plays the role of Mirabelle in the film, came in, she came in to read for a different role. Because we all know Stephanie from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, where she plays a very tough character and she has a very deep voice. But when we met her and she came in and she just started to talk to us, we all looked down at the call sheet again to say, is this really the same Stephanie Beatrice? Because it doesn't sound like her. And we immediately knew in that conversation that she actually was our Mirabelle. You could just hear it in it because Mirabelle is a character who has to be both quirky and flawed. She's got to be funny. Um, and Stephanie is just a great comedian and able to bring so much to the page through that. But she's also got to be able to sing and really sing throughout this entire film. And to get that in one person is not easy. But it is one of those things where once we heard her speak, her just natural speaking voice, we we're like, this is Mirabelle, and we, we the, have the, the thing yeah. about Steph that's so amazing. And Steph is amazing because she plays to win every time, right? Every, every moment of her life, she came in on Brooklyn Nine Nine for another part, and we were like, "She's not right for that part," but we can't let this person go. And I know that like Mike and Dan just wrote a part for her because they were like, "We're not letting her leave the building." Oh, amazing! <laughs> I have to, I have to hop in as as a Steph fan myself and collaborator and. Um, she was actually in my first professionally produced play in 2004 in Portland, Maine at a Portland stage company. And she was phenomenal. And it was very similar. She walked in and um, was so special. And then to work with her on In the Heights, you know, to come that far in both of our paths together was was really wild. Um, in, in terms of Vivo and voice actors, one of one of my favorite uh, experiences working with an actor was with Juan DeMarcos, who um, plays Andres one of the elder characters, there's two elder characters and they're both musicians. And so we thought, okay, first of all, we have to get real musicians to voice these, um, these parts. And Juan DeMarcos has never, had never acted before, uh, but he is the carrier of the Buena Vista social club legacy. He is the carrier of the Afro Cuban all-stars legacy. And so he, he brings this treasure trove of, of life experience. And I tell you, you can hear that, legacy in just the way he rounds his vowels. I mean, just his, his vocal inflections on a sentence are so magnificent, so layered and rich and so deeply alive. Um, it, it was just wonderful to hear him speak the words and um, with, with so much music, so much music in his voice. So as we all know, in recent years, there's been a focus, a strong focus on diversity and inclusion in the types of stories being told and also both in front and behind the camera. Where are you seeing progress and what needs the most attention? Clark is a producer as well as president of uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Um, what are you seeing? I think there's been, there's been incredible progress and there's still an immense amount of work to do. I think that there is more inclusive and diverse storytelling that's happening. And I, I look at, um, at at Disney Animation in terms of Moana, and I look at Ryan Last Dragon, and I look at Kanto, really looking to tell stories that are representative of people who love our movies and want to see themselves on the screen. And I think that means you have a responsibility to figure out how do you always um, bring that to the table. But it ha the area that I think is the most in most need is um, actually, you know, is behind the camera from that standpoint. And I think as an industry, we continue to see change, but we have so much change still left to do. And I think part of it is about showing people that this is an incredible industry 
that has incredible opportunities and showing it at an early age so people know that it is it's possible and and they can see what they might be able to be a part of so that we can we can actually grow as an industry in terms of making sure that we have deep representation both as you said in front and behind the camera i think we've made movement forward i've been at disney for 30 years dare i say and i can tell you it's a completely different studio than from the day i started but i can also tell you it's not where we want to be and where we need to be and where we're headed. Are there initiatives at the studio to um, to change that behind the camera? Yeah, I think the deeply it is in, on two levels. It's both trying to grow within and also look externally. It's also about saying, how do we make sure that the voices that are telling these stories are people from these experiences? And so it has to come both ways, right? Because if we're not if we're not diverse enough in, in inside who we are, we can't make that all happen. It has to be a little bit on both sides. So as a studio, when, and when Jennifer Lee, the chief creative officer, stepped into her position three and a half years ago, she set it as her top initiative. And I think that's where you see creatively where we're headed and the, the projects we're doing. And you also see what's changed internally in terms of who it is who is telling those stories. Uh, you know, a case study, um, and I agree with everything you're saying, you know, we, we are, as a business, we're a work in progress. One of the things that's really exciting is that the, the schools are much more diverse and there are a lot more women. And and beyond the schools, people are learning this this craft online on YouTube. <laughs> so the access is a lot greater than it's ever been. And when you look at our crews, they're, they're, they're much more diverse than they've ever been. And one of the challenges is leadership and making sure that we're, um, uh, we're, we're inviting people into those positions and helping them. Our production designer on Mitchell's is Lindsay Olivares, and she is, um, was somebody that we noticed on Instagram who just had an incredible um, body of personal work. And I remember being in a meeting going, we need to find a production designer who can draw like this woman. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, well, why don't we hire this woman? <laughs> uh, well, she's never been a production designer. Yeah, but this is how we want the movie to look, right? Like, we, we've we got a million people who can teach you how to, like, manage a team. And we have a lot of support here at the studio. We are a whole institution. What we need are, like, poets and inspiration. And um, and it was a really great success story um, uh, to, to watch her kick real ass <laughs> in that position um on mitchell's a lot of it was a lot of people's first movie our head of story um guillermo martinez is a puerto rican guy and he's like you know he he you know blossomed and now he's like directing a movie and it's really just one of the blessings of our business is we have these places that incubate talent over decades and and dedicating ourselves to making sure that that we're supporting a, a really diverse group of people is important. Elaine, you just made your feature directorial debut with Spirit Untamed, um, but we still don't see a lot of women directors. What are you seeing? Uh, yeah, and when I look back, uh, I, I went to school at Sheridan College up in Toronto. And I think I remember in my first year of my three-year course, I was something like one of five girls in our graduating class out of 30 people. Um, and sort of growing up through that environment, coming to DreamWorks and over the last 15 years, I've really seen a change. And I've talked to some people who are now graduating from Sheridan saying there's probably 60% girls in their class now in comparison to the 5% there was when I was there. And I really am starting to see that reflected in the people around me at the studio. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to end up with Karen Foster as my producer on this project. We were, you know, we're telling a story about three young women coming up and going on a crazy adventure together. And they, they all come from very diverse backgrounds themselves. So uh, Karen kind of made it her mission coming onto the project and myself too to make sure that we reflected that behind the camera as well. And um, our goal there was to hopefully have everyone involved in the project infusing more authenticity into the characters on screen. I think that's the only way we can be authentic about it. Um, and uh, we did end up with a lot of female leadership on the crew, our VFX soup, our, you know, our production managers, our 
story artists. I think we had something like 60, 40% women on the story team. And uh, it's just, it's changed a lot since I, I started way back in 2005. Um, I definitely see a difference. Great points you're you're all making. I, I'm really excited at Pixar. Certainly it's going through hiring and, and also just really putting people in in um in telling their stories. So when we look at our our development, um it's really 50-50. Uh, a lot of women directors coming up and a lot of different um backgrounds and, and races, which is really exciting. We really believe in personal stories, so coming in with um, uh, uh, you know, like me being an immigrant, I came in with my own point of view, but I think of course th there needs to be more, I'm still, you know, a Caucasian male. So, but, but that is enabling us to, to, uh, a Pete doctor has been very, very driven to, to get these voices into directing. So our, our developments is quite exciting and, and, you know, we have turning red, of course, uh, next year with, uh, Domi, she directing. And we have quite a few of those coming through the pipe with, with a lot of women directors, which is really exciting. The other side that I think it's interesting talking about, it's also just this representation. And, and like, I think every movie we make now, we're talking about representation and authenticity and representation. And um, like I, I, we had an interesting journey on our movie because we asked ourselves, we, okay, we, we're, we're producing 1950s Italy and, and you can start asking yourself, how do you bring some representation here? And we realized that that would have been hard to do with authenticity. And so we found all the other different ways that we could represent some diversity. So we, um, we thought, for example, more about disability and, and you know, we, um, we, we really thought hard and deep about bring people that are not always seeing themselves into the movies in there. So our Massimo character has been, was a wonderful collaboration um, with the filmmakers from Crip Camp and, and you know, the, the, this wonderful story about the civil rights of the, the disabled people. And um, so that those are things that we talk a lot about in each movie. We really think deeply about it. I don't think that every movie has to check all the boxes. That's a bit where we got to, because I think it can feel like tokenism as well. But it's so important that we're all having these conversations and really trying to uh, think about ways that we, w w these kids need to see themselves in, 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 um, on the screen wherever they're from or, and um, whatever their situation is. Yeah, I think Elaine, you were talking about the, your relationship with your producer. And I feel like this is a good opportunity for me to give a shout out to RSO. So it's like so integral in building um, the relationship that we have with our, our cultural consultants. And she she was responsible for establishing what they call the, 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 the story trust in Moana that dealt with um, that dealt with all the cultural consultants that dealt with like essentially making sure that there was a team of people that was on board from the very, very beginning of the film up until delivery and after into marketing. And we had our Southeast Asian story trust, which was essentially responsible for all the on-screen representation. And, and I know that for me stepping into animation and seeing the amount of thought and care uh, and responsibility that was going into every single decision, whether it was design, whether it was casting, whether it was in the in the boarding process, and up until you know how you you speak about the movie, uh, especially in dealing with a movie that's inspired in cultures that that are not my own, I felt like it just became so important, and it it allowed myself, Don, and the rest of the team to really feel like we were building it, this from the right place. In addition to, you know, working with, with two incredible writers from, from the region, but it, it really created a system that supported us creatively, but also, but also called us out anytime that, that maybe our good intentions were, were not really translating or making sure that we were building this, with them and not essentially just having someone to react to our ideas and showing the finished movie or you know, the nearly finished movie and say, can you give us some notes that we can tweak last minute? Like this was really from the time, like going on the, the research trips, creating the characters, creating the world, everything to like the tiniest texture that you see on, on clothing 
there was a group of people that was, it was made up of uh, cultural anthropologists. It was made of architects, uh, dancers, musicians, and, and really they were sort of like our checks. Uh, and, 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 and to me, the, the importance that they had in our storytelling really, it, it just became integral to everything we did. And, and I kind of, I, I can't really imagine making another movie, even, even when, when it's not necessarily dealing with cultures that aren't your own, just having that group of people, having that support and, and, and being so, so thoughtful about representation on screen and our responsibility as filmmakers. I, it, it was a big, big learning lesson. And I guess I, I probably sound like a, a commercial for Walt Disney animation, but, but <laughs> I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad Clark that you're all placing this much responsibility in, into yeah. representation on screen. I can vouch for that. I I felt being Italian, I got to a point where like we need our trust because I I need to double check on these things. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that's really powerful, you know, we work on a lot of different projects, and sometimes there will be um, uh, only you know a few people um, that are representative of who you're on, you know, who you're depicting on screen, and sometimes there will be this incredible multiplying effect when you've got lots of people that all relate to the same thing and they're all in the same room. For example, a project that I'm working on with a bunch of other Cuban Americans and the fact that like we all get in one place <laughs> and we all vibe on the same thing. I'm working on a project um, with a Korean American protagonist and watching that writing staff come together and how they, um, build on one another it's really important not to you know to make sure that those that our crews are not just like you say checking a box but really like creating a community right on 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 mitchell's you know um our protagonist katie is lgbtq plus and having those rooms with our crew members who identify that way sitting around talking about how best to represent her was really powerful. Just to chime in with a few kind of micro thoughts as uh, you know, these are questions that I, I think about a lot in my, in my writing for Vivo, um, two things that were really present in my mind were accents and uh, female body shapes. So with the accent casting and, and this, this comes up time and again, cause I've been writing Latino characters from the time I started writing um, was just really wanting to steer clear of, putting accents onto people that don't naturally have them. I can just hear it from a mile away. I can hear when it's not someone's natural speaking pattern. And so, and, and honoring the diversity of accents that exist within a community that is multilingual, that have different first languages, um, even within families, the, the two languages, Spanish and English might've been acquired at different ages, therefore leading to different accents. Um, so really, honoring that in casting and, and looking for actors whose voices bring that kind of richness of history and story and cultural path to, to it rather than putting an accent on them that is a quote unquote correct Latino accent or Cuban American accent. Um, and then the other one being, being body type, I just really wanted to push uh, on the body types and in particular for, for more plus size and round figured females to not still have a kind of hourglass shape that just feels enlarged, but to push against that silhouette and say, you know, can we have females in here more than one? So again, it's not tokenism, but it's the relationship of many characters and visuals and one where the waist is not smaller than the hips. You know, this is also a female silhouette that is, you know, I, I still feel imprinted on these wonderful animation heroes growing up, but they all had that body type and none of the girls in my life did, you know, and, and those things, you metabolize those things, you know, so to, to really push on those silhouettes um, felt like great place to, to play. And, and certainly I think there's more place to play like that in the future. I know I, I I've seen um, Encanto has some really really interesting silhouettes, which got me excited. And um, yeah, so certainly we're, we're far from alone in doing that, but it was nice to add, you know, one, one, another stone to that path. And, and for Flea, you know, it, it was really, it's a little different because it's a documentary, but of course I had 
it's a story about a gay Afghan boy who looks for a place to be. Uh, and and I mean, the real I mean, it was a very close collaborator in the whole process of making the film. Um, but also, you know, finding the voice actors to do um, the reenactments we had to do in Afghanistan was really also, um, you know, finding the right dialects. And we don't have a big bunch of Afghan actors in Denmark. So it was really about getting into the, the Afghan communities and finding people who who uh, could represent uh, Amin and his siblings and his family. Um, and and when we brought them into the studio to record the verses, they all brought their own stories and could could really relate to his story. They all had similar stories as Amin. All their parents had similar stories to Amin. So really that they could, you know, um, bring in their own story, uh, story and take ownership of Lee was, was super important. Um, and also we had uh, Amin and a group of Afghans really looking through every design we did to make sure that it felt right. Um, we didn't want to kind of um, push things in a way that, that, that didn't feel authentic or recognizable to, to local Afghans. How, how did you find those performers? It was really, uh, we had a casting agent who kind of went into the Afghan community in Copenhagen and the Denmark in general, uh, and just kind of started looking for people who um, did not access any of them. Uh, they're just, you know, Afghans living in Denmark. Um, but most of them have refugee background as well. Um, so all of them had almost an identical stories to women or, or had family members who had gone through the same things, you know, walking through uh, mountains or deserts or um, forests. Um, so they could really relate to what happens in the film um, and you could tell that when they, they did the voice acting uh, that, that they, they brought their own story into acting even though they're not actors they, they really brought an authenticity to everything in the film I think you know and this is building on what Jonas was just saying and Kiara you also in terms of on the accent side of things I think it's easy to go back to the same groups that people know. And if you if you only cast within, it will never expand. And I know that for us, when we were thinking about a three-generation family in Encanto, we wanted to think about how would those, to your point, Kara, how would the accents be within three generations? What would it be for Abuela, the matriarch of the family, and what would it be for the kids? And we, we worked very hard to figure out who we were going to cast for the Abuela um, role in terms of her voice, because we were looking within the United States for a, um, a Colombian actor and we couldn't find somebody who really felt like they were bringing that authentically to it. And so we had to go into Colombia and we went down there twice with a casting agent and still didn't find it. We just had to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And we found this incredible actor, uh, actress, Maria Cecilia Otero, who, by the way, is very large and big in, in Colombia, but nobody had thought about her for this role. And when we met with her, she was immediately the right person for it. She's never done anything outside of Colombia in her entire life. We met her for the first time the other night on the red carpet at the at the premiere because, of course, we recorded her from Colombia and we were doing this all during COVID, uh, it's, it's an amazing experience, but we just didn't, you can't give up. Because I think to your point, Jonas, it can be one of those things where it feels like if they're not immediately there, they might not be there, but they are. It's about doing that hard work and really figuring out how do you how do you get out there and discover and, and tap into people and give them that, that opportunity that sits there because they're going to bring so much to the role. She brought this character to life in a way that never could have been without her being the person who's doing the voice. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the interesting things about this moment is a lot of the names that are on the top of everybody's list are working and are not available. And I think the the um, the critical thing is is not to find diverse casting when it's convenient, but when it's inconvenient, like you're saying, and to push through those moments where you're like, I don't know who to, who to I don't I don't I don't know this person yet. That's to me, um, the really critical part of the work. Yeah, and it just feels like the specificity and the 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 need for authenticity is is like you don't get away, you can't get away with faking it anymore. And and I think that people see through through like lazy decision making and see through through irresponsible decision making. Uh, and I feel like that just in a great way uh, allows us all to, to look in places that probably you would not look at normally, just because, you, just because you know that you're going to, if you're making a, a story set in Colombia, if you're making um, a story that requires certain accent that you, you, you're going to need to find the right people to be in front of your screen. And, and, and I think that that's just really going to, 
I hope that the next few years we're going to start seeing like a whole new era of just on-screen representation that I'm very excited about. Totally. I think that's it. And for me, one like a big part of that too, it's not, it's not just coming in and putting butts in seats and filling the spots, you know, it, I feel like when I think about a lot of the reason why I'm probably here in a director's chair as a woman at a big animation studio, it's because of all the people around me and the people who have been around me for the last 10 years, pushing me to take opportunities I didn't necessarily feel ready for because coming up through the industry, it wasn't the norm. It wasn't the norm for a woman to be pushed into this role or take on challenges that were, you know, huge, exciting, big deals. And the people around me continuously supporting me and providing me the skills that I needed to, to fully learn what that role was as I was doing it was a terrifying process. But, you know, the environment in animation particularly is so collaborative and so supportive. And um, so uh, I think what my point was, it's not, it's not just about putting the butts in the seats, but it's allowing these people to support and providing them with the skills that they need to keep moving on and up, not just filling those roles, but taking them and running with them so that we can start seeing bigger changes in the, in the nearer future. Same, same here. Like Jen, uh, Clark was just talking about Jen and how she came on three and a half years ago. And her first sort of like mandate was to diversify the, the storytellers in the studio. And, um, I was, I think the first director that they hired after Jen came on. And I found out that, uh, in the studio's nearly 97 year old history of the first director of color to have been, to have been in there. And that just gives you a little bit of, of a sense of, of how things have worked thus far and how, you know, Jen coming on to diversify Disney animation, like see, not that, that was her role, but her, her, uh, her intention to do it seems like a, a, a fairly, uh, like, right. Like, of course everyone should try to do that, but it, it, not until you really see sort of like the patterns and you see what it means. I think you really understand the importance of, of su such an action. And, and now, you know, what has happened in the last three years in the studio, I think has been incredible to see. And, and I'll, I'll just say it again. I think that the next five years are, we're going to see, we're going to see stories and people that we have never seen before on screen. Yes. A Disney animation, but I know that across the board, just, I, I, know the stuff that Pixar is working on it. I, it, it's, it, I hope that it's the, the beginning of a new era and that we uh, never go back. <laughs> well, you have to break the pattern before you can see how, how um, pernicious the pattern is, <laughs> right? It almost doesn't become visible. But one of the things I think is really important is to make sure to make the affirmative case for this uh, movement, which is that the movies get better. <laughs> and the audience is better served and you can make more money <laughs> as I feel like so often we make the punitive case that like, Oh, we're doing this so that we don't get called out. But, but we're doing this because the it's better for the medium and better for the audience. You know, just having uh, had Halloween, <laughs> it was really, really cool to see a bunch of young Latinas of all hues, you know, just out there with their different body types, dressed up as Gabby, like unapologetic, like this is me with a little extra sauce because Gabby's got some extra sauce. But these these little details were really exciting. And it does speak to that. It, it, it excites the audiences too. It excites the people who are watching the movies too. Same for us. Kui, one of our screenwriters in Raya, tells this beautiful story about Halloween a few days ago. He was walking around with his kids. Um, he's Vietnamese. And that they started seeing all of these women dress up as Raya. And one of his kids just looks up at him and says, Dad, you did this. And it, it, like, I think what it meant for him to hear those words and what it meant for his kids to see, see these people, it's, it's uh, I don't think that you can put it into words. And I'm just so happy to, you know, see the people that are here on this panel, see the people that are making movies right now. And, and uh, it, it's a good time, I think, for animation. You know, I, going back to the idea of also casting from afar, um, there's a wonderful silver lining about this 
pandemic that I think in a weird way, I don't know if you guys have had uh, uh, and gals have had this experience, but it kind of opened our thinking of, because now we're used to work this way anyway, we actually ended up casting way more from Italy personally than we would have thought normally, because normally it'd be like, well, you have to come into the studio and, and there's these things to these hoops to jump through. And yeah, one wonderful, I mean, you know, now it's a little difficult. You're recording from people's closets, but it actually is opening um, opportunities to really work all over the world with, with, uh, with uh, talent, which I, I yeah. thought was a wonderful thing. And I think it's voice talent, but it's also just behind behind the scenes. Like we all of a sudden are able to work with people in Europe. And I know that uh, Clark and Jen are developing something with an African team. And I feel like all of a sudden the the, the geographical boundaries really don't mean anything. Uh, and we're, yeah, we're able to bring in story artists and voice talents and it, it, it's, it's uh it's it is a silver lining and it's you know unfortunate that it took this for us to realize yeah, that right. that it was it was so easy to to break these borders but you know here we are and uh, at least one good thing will come out of it we've always been a, a worldwide art form you know like we've we've all made the pilgrimage to annecy <laughs> and like when i was going to school my professor would smuggle films out of Poland <laughs> to show. And, and so we've always been looking at work from all around the world. And, um, and it really is exciting to know that like you can hire a board artist from anywhere <laughs> and they can work and be part of your crew. They might lose a little sleep <laughs> or you might, <laughs> um, but it's remarkable how, how fluid the work process is. And I agree with you um, recording actors, you know, somewhere else in the world remotely is surprisingly um, uh, it surprisingly works and it's creative and you don't really see a lot of fall off in performance. I actually found when we were recording our really, our, our much younger actors, I guess uh, our snips character was played by a kid named Lucian Perez, who I think was under 10 years old. And um, when we were recording him, I'm pretty sure we, you know, we had a big silver lining with that because when he was recording, he was sitting in his bedroom surrounded by his own things. His mom was in the next room and he wasn't sent into this weird sound booth with lights pointing at him and all the microphones. And because of that, I feel like he was really able to just be a kid and sound like a kid. Um, and I feel like that was one of the, the lucky parts of recording from home. In recent years, we've also seen just this explosion of animated work, um, particularly from the streaming services. Where do you see animation heading? I mean, it's such an exciting time. The work is always blows me away. The work in television is so experimental. This is an experimental medium. You know, you could do it under a camera. You can do it with sand. <laughs> you can um, pixelate. Like, I've always loved that side of it. And, and and just to be able to, the technology and the amount of work facilitating that experimentation. The student work is so scary because it's so good. <laughs> We're all doomed. I just hope they hire me because I need to <laughs> keep my insurance. <laughs> the future. Yeah, I, I would chime in and also say that, yeah, I love that it's pushing it's pushing the medium in, in in several different ways. I, I, I feel again, Jonas is your perfect. Yeah. I, I was very excited that, that uh, what you were doing with flea and, and, you know, that that's pushing documentary in a new direction. I love Elizabeth Ito comes to mind with, um, the best the ghost <laughs> is like, okay, that is a, such a unique, beautiful new way to take, um, a TV show, an animated TV show. And, so that I, you see these wonderful sparks that 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 are completely new and wouldn't have happened without this uh, request from the streaming. I also think on a on a Pixar side, we're excited because even something someone like Pixar, like a studio like Pixar, now it's it's asking some of the creators again gives an opportunity to diverse creators and it gives the creators an opportunity to play with longer form, which Pixar hasn't done, for example. So even in a small way, there's an excitement in trying a, a form that for a studio like Pixar has been focused on only shorts and features to 
do oh okay now we have a tv series so um it's really exciting it's also i think the independent world is so exciting uh, and like phil to hear that you found your production designer on instagram it's, like, <laughs> it's just such such an incredible story and i feel like those are going to become more and more popular like your your the accessibility and the ease that you have to upload something and to find an audience and to all of a sudden like become become a known entity just from the work that you're doing in your bedroom on your garage i feel like like i hope that those filmmakers get more and bigger opportunities in the next few years because i feel like the the time when the instagram artists and the instagram animators and illustrators start to get feature film and studio support i i just feel like the industry as a whole is going to grow in like such a beautiful beautiful unexpected way yeah you don't need a camera i remember yeah. i drove like six hours to new york to shoot my student film you don't need that anymore. you could do it on photoshop <laughs> you could do it on your phone your friend's phone you know the the access is incredible and I think, you know, it, we've been limited in ways by the number of shows either television needed in the day and or theaters wanted in the day or the amount of money a studio might have to invest into either of those two things. But now it's not that way. It's, it's, it's unlimited in a way, even though there's only so much money in the world, there is so much more money being invested into creative talent and what's going out there because there is all of these all of these services exist, whether again, it's theaters or whether it's in streaming or whether it's, you know, um, television as we knew it before streaming that need creative product. And they're willing to experiment to, to what you said, Bill. they're willing to experiment and take risks that they would never have been able to do before because it was always one movie or two TV series that they were investing in. So they took the safe route instead of the, let's give this person or this idea a shot and see where, is it go where it goes. And you see those things then take off that never would have been um, out there in the world today. So I think it's just expanding the creative community in such a huge way. It, you know, as, as Enrico was saying, at, um, at Disney, because of Disney Plus, we've literally expanded into series that we've never done before at Disney Animation. And we have five in development and production. And it's exciting to see a different way of doing storytelling. And whether it's with IP that people already know and they're excited to see these characters come back or originals, it's things we couldn't have done before. So I think it's a really exciting time for the industry. And Clark, do you want to also touch on how you feel about theaters having reopened? It's it's so exciting to have theaters reopening and having our films be in them. I think the communal experience is one of those things I've always loved. I love to go into a theater with a space of people with a, that's filled with people where you don't know what the story is or who the characters are or the world and see it unfold and experience it in a large setting with a group. It's not only about it being, you know, big on a screen and the sound It's the actual experience of having the person next to you feel the emotion, whether it's that it's sad or that they're laughing or that they're wondering what's going to happen next, you get enveloped into that. And I don't think that that can be replicated as easily um, at home. I think both worlds exist and it's exciting. And, and, you know, we've been fortunate in the animation industry during this whole pandemic to be able to keep working. We we're very, very fortunate from that standpoint. And that there were places that our films could go to and people can see and, and find these characters and see these worlds. But it's exciting to see that the theaters are also coming back and that both can coexist in a really great way. I mean, nothing will be the experience of sitting in a theater watching a film with people. But I will say that, I mean, Raya, for example, got a, a dual release uh, where it was also uh, released on Disney Plus. And I will say that that ease of accessibility and being able to give people an opportunity to have them, you know, on their phones and the computers and to watch and rewatch and to replay, um, I feel like it offers this other layer of, of, of entry into the industry where like you know before you could go see a movie and there was a part you loved you better remembered it or you had to pay you know for another ticket to see it again uh if if you could and just the ability now for people to have these films at the tip of the finger is anytime i i feel like it just creates a connection between the, our audiences and our material that just didn't exist before um and i i I, I think the relationship that like the, the profound in, profoundly intimate relationship that has existed now where people can rewatch something, where people can 
analyze little moments, replay songs, uh, like connect the characters a whole other level. I, I, I hope that we can continue to foster both of those as I, I know we are. Yeah, it's exciting. Even playing different and playing different uh, language versions. That's uh, yeah, that exactly. Like yeah. With, with Luca, we had so many people wanting to watch the Italian version and then watch the English version. And I think there's wonderful uh, silver linings. I, I think I, I'll say that there's so many pros and cons, right? Like I think what I love about the cinema is also in today's age there's not going to be your, you have to pick up the phone or you, you're going to, that there's just no distraction. And that is what I love about being in that communal experience. But I, I'm absolutely agreeing with you that there, there's something special about ev also the world seeing it together. There's something pretty special about this content being out there for everybody to see it at the same time, which it was always scattered in many days, right? Through the world. Yeah, and, and, and so many people who didn't, you know, we take it for granted here in the States where we have so many movie theaters and, and like go, the movie, the movie watching experience. I think there are so many benefits to this digital era. So my family in, from Mexico is telling me like, I, I watched Raya, we watched it in, in English and then we watched it again in Spanish. And then we were able to sort of like learn, like it, it just adds so many layers of interactivity that I think are, are valuable. Well, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much. For a great conversation and congratulations to all of you on your movies thank you thank you thanks, thanks, thanks for having us it's great meeting all you guys yeah, yeah. yeah likewise congratulations great. everybody yeah a real pleasure <laughs>